Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, awesome. Welcome to our Phi Beta Kappa Society of the Cincinnati Convocation. My name is Emily Cook. As president of the Gamma of Virginia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, I am very happy to welcome you to the annual Phi Beta Kappa Society of the Cincinnati Convocation. I am especially happy to welcome the families and friends of our initiates in this 108th year of Phi Beta Kappa at Washington and Lee University. As we begin, I want to acknowledge the Phi Beta Kappa committee and our other colleagues whose hard work has made today's celebration possible. Immediate past president, pres immediate past president Janet Ikeda, right there taking pictures. <laughs> Secretary Treasurer Elliot King. Exec Executive Committee members Rebecca Benefiel and Paul Gregory. <laughs> Jessica Wager of the Provost Office and Debbie Alden of the Registrar's Office. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs> this occasion brings us together to honor those who have truly excelled in their pursuit of knowledge as evidenced by their exceptional academic records. Since its inception at the College of William and Mary in 1776, the Phi Beta Kappa Society has inducted as members as those individuals whose character and scholarly attainments exemplified its principles and ideas. Since chapters of Phi Beta Kappa exist only at the very best colleges and universities, election to membership in the society is an honor rightly to be cherished and celebrated. Those whom the Gamma of Virginia chapter has initiated into Phi Beta Kappa today have realized impressive academic achievements across the broad spectrum of the liberal arts. As outstanding scholars of good moral character, they deserve to be elected to the society. In a moment, we shall recognize them, after which we will hear from our distinguished guest speaker, who is able to join us today through the generosity and support of the Society of the Cincinnati and the President's Office. We acknowledge that Phi Beta Kappa's long-standing relationship with the Society of the Cincinnati and the common bond these two societies share, devotion to our country and to Washington and Lee. In 1783, in response to a near revolt by disgruntled veterans of the Continental Army, General George Washington's Chief of Artillery, of Artillery proposed a fraternal and philanthropic organization to preserve those exalted rights and liberties of human nature for which the revolution had been fought. Bye. <laughs> All right. We're just hanging. Washington agreed to serve as its first president general of the new society of the Cincinnati, which took its name from the Roman hero, Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus. According to legend, he was appointed dictator to defend Rome against enemies who had surrendered, surrounded the Roman army. Hi. It's okay. I don't, was there a problem? Is it better? better. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Executive committee member, Rebecca Benefield. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you guys still want to know about Cincinnati? Okay, cool. Um, according to legend, he was appointed dictator to defend Rome against enemies who had surrounded the Roman army. He saved Rome in 16 days, relinquished power, and then returned home to his farm. Among the early members of the society were six men who had attended our predecessor, Liberty Hall Academy, or one of its earlier incarnations, and several vigorous advocates of the young school, including General Washington himself and cavalry officer during the Revolutionary War, Light Horse Harry Lee, who had become the father of Robert E. Lee. Yet another advocate for the school was Major Alexander Stewart, who had donated 40 acres to Liberty Hall in 1776. He had fought bravely during the Revolution and was captured in battle at Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina. At the same battle was his son, Archibald Stewart, an alumnus of another of our predecessors, Augusta Academy, who became the president of the Phi Beta Kappa chapter at William & Mary and who carried the society steel into battle with him. In 1802, the Society of Cincinnati ceded its treasury of approximately $25,000 to Washington College. The gift from the Society of the Cincinnati continues to support both this convocation and an endowed chair in the mathematics department. With the society's gift also came some stipulations that the university continues to honor. 
One was that the college institutes studies in fortifications and gunnery. Sure enough, as those of you who have attended this convocation before may recall, such a course is still offered by mathematics department. The course is called military engineering. It carries no credit and has no course number. <laughs> but a recent course catalog indicates that for qualified students who may request it, a course in fortifications, gunnery, and ballistics will be offered. It is fitting that the Society of the Cincinnati's generosity to the university and its support, past and present, for a liberal arts mission are linked with today's celebration of our, under, of our outstanding young scholars. We of Phi Beta Kappa continue to be deeply grateful to the Society of the Cincinnati. I now call upon our chapter secretary treasurer, Professor Elliot King, to announce the names of those recently elected to membership in our society. Professor King will also bring to your attention some noteworthy scholarly attainments of other students. Professor King. Last year, the Gamma of Virginia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa elected to membership as juniors, 22 members of the class of 2019. I'll read those names now. Hamad Ahmad, Ryder Tobin Babak, Nathan Lear Brewer, Hung Viet Chu, Natalie Stephanie Dabrowski, Alex Farley, Joshua Fox, Rosella Ivana Gabriel, Margaret Grace Callis, Morgan Maloney, Julia, Julia Mayol, Mary Hampton Brown McNeil, Catherine Oakley, Catherine Kaledi Osowski, Henry Carr Patrick III, Justin J. Peterson, Lauren Elizabeth Pupa, Jackson Arthur Roberts, Lisa Amy Roth, Brittany Lynn Smith, Mohini Tongri, and Aidan Patrick Valenti. And now for this year's initiates. We will recognize initiates by class. As I read your name, please come up on stage and face the audience and remain on stage until all of your classmates have been recognized. Uh, to the audience, please hold your applause until all of the initiates have been announced and they're on stage. From the class of 2019, Aaron on. Jocelyn Grace Anker. John Xavier Broderick. Joseph Carmody. Catherine Dow. Susan Lindsay Fields. George Lincoln Frank. Ethiopia Demolosh. Gatecho, John Herschel Gibson III, and I'll fade into the background. Ma Maxwell Gold, Perfect. Jung Ju Ha, Ethan Mayer Hartman, Lorena Hernandez Barcena, Teresa Ray Hill, Faith Abigail Isbell, Catherine Sinclair McAvoy, Cordelia Richards Robinson Peters, Eleanor Evangeline Rose, Christopher Scott Simmons Jr., Martha Davis Strasky, Christopher Taubin, Sutton Page Travis, Heath Varnado V, and Pengree Wang. Let's congratulate these new initiates from the class of 2019. Good photo ops. Excellent. You can take your seat. Thank you. And you can take your seat. Thank you. <laughs> and now members of the class of 2020. Their individual grade point averages place them in the top 5% of the junior class. So these I just read this, or do they come up as well? They come up as well. They come up as well. It's not on here, so I'm just checking. Okay, please come up as well. Uh, Harris and McLean Billings. Laura Elaine Bruce, Balin Essek, Jenna Eve Fearson, Catherine Ingram, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chantal Yasso, 
Tiffany Bokyung Ko, Stevan Andrew Chris, Maxwell Andrew Lehman, Taylor Griffin Link, Kara G. Lau, Chase Walton Major, Nicholas Bennett Maurer, Abigail Kathleen Nason, Trang Han Yen, Pakriti Panthi, Samuel Halstead Pumphrey, Peyton Jean Smith, Kana K. White, Hannah Margaret Witherell, Matthew O'Neill Withers, and Jiahu Zhang. Let's congratulate these new initiates from the class of 2020. We also welcome Thomas E. Camden, class of 1976, as an alumni member. Phi Beta Kappa President Emily Cook will read a brief statement about why Professor Camden received this honor today. Ms. Cook. Although those in attendance are likely familiar with Tom and his many accomplishments, here's just a brief outline of his career and scholarly attainments. Tom graduated from WNL in 1976 with a Bachelor's of Arts and Religion. He later received his Master's of Science in Library of Science from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville in 1980. Tom then rose through the ranks of the library archives profession, working as a manuscripts curator at the New Hampshire Historical Society, helming the Hergret Book and Manuscript Library at the University of Georgia, directing the Museum and Research Library at the George C. Marshall Foundation, and serving as the Director of Special Collections at the Library of Virginia. Tom joined WNL in 2013 as the Head of Special Collections and Archives. Under his guidance, long overlooked archival resources have been rediscovered and made available for curricular use for the first time. In addition to facilitating student and faculty scholarship, Tom continues to indulge his own love of learning. He frequently researches the provenance of historic artifacts and communicates his findings through presentations and various written forms of publication. Tom has brought new life to WNL's archives, making them the lifeblood of research, curriculum, and historical understanding at Washington and Lee. In conclusion, the above outlines only a small window into the scholarly impact Tom Camden has upon the archival community and on WNL. Tom epitomizes Phi Beta Kappa's motto, the love of learning is the guide of life, and I am proud to welcome him into our membership. Tom E. Camden, please come to the stage and be recognized. several other awards. First is the Phi Beta Kappa J. Brown Goring Award. We present it to the sophomore sophomores who achieved the highest academic average during their first four terms at WNL. The award is named for a man who truly exemplifies Phi Beta Kappa at Washington and Lee, Professor J. Brown Goring. Dr. Goring, a chemistry professor at WNL for 38 years, served as secretary treasurer of the Gamma of Virginia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa for 22 of those 38 years. I'd like the two recipients from the class of 2021 to come to the stage and receive our congratulations and their certificates. Chi Shing Adrian Lam and Robert V. Macy.
Awesome. Next is the Edward Lee Penny Prize. The Student Affairs Committee gives it to an undergraduate or undergraduates who, as the words of the prize, demonstrate extraordinary commitment both to the personal both to personal scholarship and to the nurturing of intellectual life of Washington Lee. I'd like this person to come to the stage and receive our congratulations, Lorena Hernandez Bersena. We also have a gift from the economics department. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize several other recent fellowship winners, and I invite them to stand if they're here. Uh, Tori Hester, Critical Language Scholarship to Study Chinese in China. Ryan Carpenter, Research Internship in Science and Engineering at the University of Lübeck, Germany. Wade Patterson, Research Internship in Science and Engineering with the Seckenberg Natural History, Na sorry, Natural History Collections in Dresden, Germany. Ching Chang Wang, Davis Projects for Peace Award for the Project in China. Catherine Dow, Combined Study ETA Fulbright to Austria. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Kaledi Osowski, Research Fulbright in India. Molly Sykes, German American Exchange Internship in Frankfurt, Germany. Hank Patrick, NCAA Postgraduate Scholarship. Samantha Yates, NCAA Postgraduate Scholarship. Julia Hernandez, Public Policy and International Affairs Junior Summer Institute at the University of Minnesota. Gareth Minson, Public Policy and International Affairs Junior Summer in Institute at Princeton University. Francis Marie Pugh, Public Policy and International Affairs Junior Summer Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And Zainab Abiza, Schwartzman Scholarship to China. Let's give a round of applause for you. <laughs> Now I return to podium. Now we go. I would like to share just a few observations with our newest members. Washington and Lee enjoys a national reputation for academic excellence. Assurance that this reputation will endure depends both on those who teach and on those who study here for it is by our work's quality that the university will be continued to be measured. You, the new members of Phi Beta Kappa, do well to understand the honor and responsibility that are now yours. It has been and will be our privilege to know you and to instruct you. By your accomplishments, you have earned our gratitude and highest commendation, and you have clearly exhibited your desire to embrace and uphold the love of learning. Open-minded inquiry, lively debate, and a free flow of information that stem from the liberal arts tradition. I challenge you to keep these qualities in mind throughout your life as you represent Washington and Lee around the country and around the world. Be an ambassador of both Phi Beta Kappa and WNL by encouraging others to engage in open-minded inquiry that is the hallmark of a liberal arts education. That is the hallmark of a Washington and Lee education. I now have the pleasure of introducing our convocation speaker, Frederick Lawrence. I first heard Fred speak at the 2018 Phi Beta Kappa Triennial Council in Boston. And I was very impressed by his commitment to the liberal arts and sciences and higher education. Fred is the 10th secretary and CEO of the Phi Beta Kappa Society, the national organization under which all of our individual university chapters live. He is also a distinguished lecturer at the Georgetown Law Center and has previously served as president of Brandeis University, dean of the George Washington University School of Law, and visiting professor and senior research scholar at Yale Law School. Please join me in welcoming Phi Beta Kappa Society and CEO Fred Lawrence as he talks about the 21st century resonance of Phi Beta Kappa's values. Thank you, Emily. Congratulations to all of you, particularly my newly minted fellow Phi Bates. I haven't had a chance to meet all of you or even many of you individually, but I know three things about you by dint of the fact that you're sitting here. First, you managed to get yourself to one of only 290 
schools in the country that have chapters of Phi Beta Kappa. That's less than 10% of all the colleges and universities in the country. Second, obviously, you have performed at the highest level here. You have challenged yourself and you have performed at the, at the highest level. And for those two things, you should be duly proud. The third thing I know about you is that each of you, in a different way, has been greatly blessed by somebody, a teacher, a parent, a friend, a sibling, probably thinking of that person right now. Somebody who said the right word at the right moment. Somebody who took you in a direction you never could have imagined. Maybe a direction that brought you to this country, maybe a direction that brought you to your area of study. And for that, I fear you cannot be proud, but you can be grateful, and you can be humble, and you can feel responsible. And those three values of gratitude, humility, and responsibility are really at the core of what Phi Beta Kappa is about. I'll be doing a number of things that come in threes in this talk, so I'll tell you that from the get-go. That's our first three. Uh, the next three are the three stars in the key, but we need a little background first before we get to the Phi Beta Kappa key. You know, it's easy when you tell the iconic story of the founding of Phi Beta Kappa, as we did during the very secret ceremony that you do before, of, you know, his parents and supporters and friends, you're not to be trusted, apparently, that you couldn't come to this, <laughs> this ceremony before. But that's because we showed them the secret handshake, and if we showed you that, we'd have to kill you, so we just can't do that. Uh, but it's easy to tell the story in a kind of almost, um, you know, Hamilton in the room when it happened kind of way. You know, there they were, five undergraduates at the College of William and Mary in the Apollo room of the Raleigh Tavern, and they got together on the cold winter night of December 5th, 1776, to found the Phi Beta Kappa Society. That means you are now members of the first secret society in America that was founded in a bar. <laughs> and yet there's some significance to the fact that it was founded in a tavern. It turns out that most of the most significant revolutionary ideas that came out of that movement were started in either taverns or coffee houses. That will strike you as familiar. Those are your two key beverages that have gotten you through your undergraduate life, I suspect. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. Those were the places in which one could gather in a semi-public place outside of the prying ears of the crown during colonial times. And they could discuss revolutionary ideas and make no mistake about it. It was truly revolutionary. They gathered well, who were these five students at the College of William and Mary? You know, it's easy to think of them as having ruffled collars and saying things like here, here, and whatever it is they said in the 18th century. They were young people just like you, finishing college just like you, in a time of enormous uncertainty, just like ours. Not sure how it was all going to come out, as I suspect many of you are not. And they gathered on that night and they committed themselves to the most astonishing idea that of all things, it would be the love of learning. That would be, as we usually say, the guide of their lives. Not some dogma, not the crown, but the love of learning. And not even learning itself, the process, the love of learning is what would be the guide to their lives. Now we know several things about what actually took place on December 5th, 1776. Um, one is that they selected the name of the organization to which you belong, which was not, in fact, Phi Beta Kappa. The name of the society, I know you're thinking this has all been a big mistake then. Um, the name of the, of the group they committed themselves to and they founded was called Societas Philosophia, Philosophical Society, if you will. And that's why on the back of your key, when you get one, you'll see it says SP in Roman letters. And they adopted a motto in Greek, Philosophia Bio Kubernetes, from which we now take the name Phi Beta Kappa. Now we usually translate the motto as love of learning is the guide of life. And it's at this point when I normally pause and ask if there's actually a classicist in the room so that somebody will actually know what I'm saying. I know I've got at least one, <laughs> and there probably are a few others I could smoke out at this moment, so I can't make it up. I gotta know what I'm talking about here. Kubernetes, which we usually translate as guide, is actually the same uh, root word as the English word governor, 
but it has a marine connotation, a nautical connotation. So a better translation than love of learning is the guide of life is actually love of learning is the pilot of life, the steerer, the helms person. There's a subtle but significant difference because the guide takes you on a path that already exists. The pilot steers you out into the waters where there is no path yet. And sometimes the waters are choppy, as they are today, and as they were in 1776. And they committed themselves that night that in the time of choppy waters, it would be the love of learning that would be the pilot of their lives. They also selected, designed this shield, and actually this is a great prop to have because the key comes later. The key comes in about the 1820s, 1830s. Anybody know why you turn it into a key instead of a shield? Wouldn't even think of it anymore now that we have cell phones and therefore don't need watches, and if you had watches, you certainly don't need a pocket watch, and so the key was used for winding a pocket watch. But the original was this shield. That's what they came up with December 5th, 1776. And this design, the letters for uh, Philosophia Bio Kubernetes and the three stars. And the stars, let's see how good your short-term memory is from having heard this only an hour ago. The stars stand for? Morality. Somebody say it again, say it again. Morality. Morality, good, interesting. Morality is the first one you pick. I want to come back to that, very good. Morality is one. Second? Come on, you don't, the worst you can be is wrong. What? Friendship. Friendship is, is usually when we come to last, and yet in some ways it's the most powerful, isn't it? And then the third, final? Literature. literature. What they called literature, but we, would, we take literature to mean fiction. That's not how they meant it. They meant it in the 18th century sense of learning, scholarship, all um, arts and letters, that kind of literature. So we would say scholarship, integrity, friendship. And I want to say a word about why these three, what these three were, because they do inspire us still. Scholarship, particularly to them, I mean, again, think about what was going on in their lives. This was not all that far from here in Williamsburg. In the midst of the Revolutionary War, actually pretty early in the Revolutionary War, they had no idea how it was going to come out. They suspected, most of them, that they would lose friends in that war, and they were right. They thought they might be in harm's way, and they were definitely right. Had Phi Beta Kappa not been spread to Harvard and Yale within the next couple of years, it would have been stillborn because the British occupied Williamsburg and burned it to the ground, along with all the records of William and Mary and all the records of Phi Beta Kappa. And that was the end of the Alpha chapter until the 1850s. So they were not wrong to think that this was a time of actual risk and peril. It was not about learning scholarship looking in. It was about scholarship and learning looking out and understanding the world and engaging in the world. And I believe they understood another triad that I'll suggest, that the liberal arts education, the liberal arts and science education that you've all engaged in, actually prepares us for life in each of three ways, for a meaningful life, for a productive life, and for an engaged life. Now, the meaningful life is the one we tend to talk about the most the meaningful life in terms of understanding the world in which we live, in terms of understanding the philosophic questions that you have. What does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean to live an important life? Those are questions that people have wrestled with for thousands of years, and we enter into dialogue with them and learn from them and learn beyond them. And that's part of what it means to have a meaningful life, to walk into a cathedral and be able to read the space, to hear a piece of music, and to know where it fits in context. That is a meaningful life. But that's not all a liberal education is about. It is also about a productive life. And by productive, I actually mean the nuts and bolts of what those young founders were worried about, and some of you are as well, which is what comes next. And as mom and dad sometimes ask you, is there a job at the end of this? That's not, am I right? You can stop me when I'm wrong, mom and dad, yeah. Um, that's not antithetical to the values of Phi Beta Kappa, far from it. That's actually at the core. We can measure this in lots of different ways. I mean, for example, bottom line, one of the best predictors of a six-figure salary is people who have taken a large number of courses outside of their major. Now, who would have known that? 
Majority of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, in fact, study the liberal arts as undergraduates. It makes you a creative thinker. It makes you a supple thinker. It makes you a problem solver. Think of it this way. There's a company called Facebook, see? And Facebook's suffering from pr some pretty serious problems right now. Does anybody think the most serious problems Facebook has could be solved by another coder? Coding is not where their challenges are right now. What they need to turn to is what is taught in philosophy, in sociology, in social psychology, in history, and other disciplines of the liberal arts and sciences. So it is precisely the productive piece of the arts and sciences that influences that. The world is changing faster than we can imagine. You know that perfectly well. If I tell you you're being prepared not for your first job, but for your 10th job, it sometimes freaks your parents out. It doesn't freak you out. You expect to have that many jobs. To be able to change is to know it is not even the learning that you learned here. It is the process, the love of learning. And that is the productive life. And then the engaged life. The engaged life both with each other, hence that third core value of friendship, but also in terms of your role in the society. We know that graduates of liberal arts institutions vote at higher levels, register to vote at higher levels. That's not the only way to measure it, but it's one way to measure it. And so when I talked at the beginning about being grateful and humble and responsible, that sense of responsibility is what you're going to give back to your communities, to your nation, and to a world so deeply in need of healing and the skills that you will bring to it. And that is, I think, what they meant by scholarship, a scholarship that understood the world, that affected the world, that changed the world, and that was engaged with the world. Now, a word about morality. Interesting at Washington and Lee, that came out first. I had a place so infused with the honor system, such that when I was leaving Morris House, where I was staying, and trying to get the door to lock, I was gently told by my host that we don't really have to worry about that here. Um, <laughs> let me tell you something. Washington, D.C., we locked the door. <laughs> and that's from the good guys, not just the bad guys. <laughs> so you've been imbued with this sense of honor and integrity which was one of their core values. But, but today of all days, I have to say just another word about that. We are living in a moment, by which I mean the past week, when higher education has been shaken to its core by an admissions scandal that goes beyond what any of us, I think, would have imagined. The notion that money plays a role in higher education is hardly shocking. And it may have its strengths, it may have its weaknesses, but hardly shocking. The notion that people would betray trust put in them by systems and universities to line their own pockets and to betray the entire system of higher education is shocking. And I'm using that word purposefully. The human spirit so wants to go chronic and not live in the acute. You know what I mean by the difference between chronic and the acute? You can't live in an emergency sense all the time. You want to go chronic and say, it's just day to day. It is so terribly important that we do not allow a lack of integrity to become an issue we view as a chronic issue. It is acute and it is an emergency. It threatens the very core of what higher education is about. And what you have committed yourselves to here at this school of all schools over these past four years is a life of honor which is not to be naive. Instead, it is to understand the true meaning of what they were talking about on that night of December 5th, 1776. And then last, least, most, friendship. Of all things, friendship. What an odd one to put in that triad. I mean, we use the word friend now so trivially. You know, how many friends do you have, right? 147,000 friends. Um, <laughs> better not invite them all to the same party. Um, that's not what they meant by friendship. And on a deep level, it's not what you mean by friendship either. I watched some of your faces when certain people's names were read for things. And I watched you light up for each other. Like, that's what it means to be a friend. 
and to be engaged in a sense of enjoying each other's accomplishments and knowing that none of us is as good as all of us and none of us is as smart as all of us and none of us is as accomplished as all of us. And that sense of engagement with each other individually, locally, regionally, nationally, even internationally, that I believe is what they meant by friendship. And those were the core values that they dedicated themselves back in 1776. I want to conclude by sharing with you some words that I found particularly inspiring from 100 years ago, literally 1919, by the president of Phi Beta Kappa nationally at the time. Um, and, and it should be put in context just for a moment. Um, so 1919, Phi Beta Kappa had been around for um, not quite a century and a half. This chapter had existed for a handful of years at that point. Um, it was founded in 1911, right? So eight years, uh, this chapter had been founded as the Gamma of Virginia. Phi Beta Kappa lives on three-year cycles. Every three years, we have these big triennial meetings. That was the meeting that uh, Emily referred to. 1919 meant that the president was addressing Phi Beta Kappa for the first time in three years since 1916. What had happened between 1916 and 1919? The world had come apart in a way they couldn't have imagined. World War I hadn't started, but America had gotten involved in World War I in that time, with many Phi Bates along with an entire generation who went off, many of whom did not come back, and those who came back were profoundly changed, and those who didn't leave were changed by their coming back. So he looked out at a world that was so different from what it had been three years ago. Here's what he said, referring to the, what he called the mission of Phi Beta Kappa. He said, the fundamental faith of Phi Beta Kappa is in the inexhaustible value of the accumulated experience of the human race as a guide to wise action in all relations of life. But this faith, he said, is no mere conservative force limiting progress and controlling its advance. We believe in our motto, he said. We cognize philosophy as the pilot of life not concerned to keep the ship in harbor, but to guide it safely through dangerous waters. The problem, therefore, for us today, both as individuals and as a society, and I do believe he meant the double entendre of a Phi Beta Kappa society and an American society. The problem, therefore, for us today, both as individuals and as a society, is to make our faith active and effective in the changing world around us. For us, a hundred years later, that problem of making our faith both active and effective in the changing world around us continues to inspire as a challenge for all of us. Indeed, I would say it is more important than ever. Eleanor Roosevelt famously said, it is better to light one candle than to sit and curse the darkness. So my fellow candle lighters, welcome to Phi Beta Kappa. Thank you to Fred. Your speech was wonderful, and thank you for coming to our secret initiation and our public convocation, and also spending time with some of our amazing students. I know it's meant a lot to all of us. Congratulations to the new initiates, and thank you for everyone for helping us honor them. We invite everyone to join us for a reception right outside this room. Um, new initiates, we have to take a group photograph before you can um, enjoy your sodas and um, wonderful cheese. Uh, so <laughs> stay together for a second. And finally, Tom Camden, also a new initiate, has graciously allowed us to um, open up special collections again so your parents and family members can go and, some, and see some of our historic treasures, um, some of which are related to the Society of the Cincinnati. So we now conclude our annual convocation. Thank you. Enjoy the cheese. I hope to speak with you all shortly. Thank you.